at its worst, I maybe worked until 4 a.m., woke up the next day at 7 back in the office no. and did that for a week. McKinsey, Bain, BCG. What is the allure of MBB? MBB is is the moment. She's it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. They are the three most prominent management consulting firms. I think what surprised me when I was going to McKinsey, it is very team-based and almost tribal. At least for McKinsey, once you find your people, you stick with it, and that is a tremendous feeling, but also if you don't have that, you feel lost and out of place. The hardest I've ever worked for anything was my McKinsey offer. Really? Yes. It really is a crazy experience to be thrown into business school, meet 400 strangers, and then after a year and a couple months, you feel like these are the closest people you've ever been with in your life. This might be opening up a can of worms, but what is a search fund? That's very powerful and a very deep takeaway. I didn't know I was there. We're there. Yeah, we're exactly. We're I guess we're up. digging deep. In the most basic terms, like you were explaining it to a third grader, what is management consulting? In the most basic, basic terms, I think management consulting is... Welcome to Cherie's Corner, a podcast where we dive into the topic of career and hear from my friends and guests who are killing it in the business world so we can learn from their lessons, their wisdoms, and their mistakes. I'm your host, Cherie, and currently I'm a business school student at Stanford University. Previously, I had roles in tech and venture capital. In this episode, I speak with my Stanford classmate, Mike Peng. He studied chemical engineering at UT Austin and worked at McKinsey in consulting before coming to the GSB. In this episode, Mike decodes management consulting and the allure of MBB, McKinsey, Bain, and BCG. What exactly do consultants do every day? What are their hours like? What are the pros and cons of the consulting lifestyle? Mike walks us through his framework of figuring out his dream job and experimenting along the way. It's such an open and honest conversation and I'm so excited for you guys to join along. Let's dive in. Hi, Mike. Hi, Cherie. Thank you for coming on to Cherie's Corner Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to have you on the show. Oh my gosh, stop. Um, when we first get started with Cherie's Corner, I give the opportunity for my guests to ask me any questions they would like. So hardball, softball, ask away. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, well, I have lots of questions for you, but my top three would be, number one, what was your first TikTok video that you ever made? Mm. This goes back all the way to 2020. I don't know if I can pinpoint like the exact like number one first TikTok video, but I just remember during the pandemic scrolling a lot, seeing videos like cat videos and dance videos, probably. Oh, actually I do remember the first video I made. It was a dance video with an ex-boyfriend. <laughs> it was, um, I'm a savage. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Prime time of TikTok. Literally. Really. Did it? Did it? Did oh! It. <laughs> so yes, it was uh, Megan The Stallion, the savage dance trend that was going on, um, and that was the first video we made. I don't think uh, I, I published it, and it is now private. So if you go back, you can't find it anymore. If someone has a downloaded copy, I would love to see. <laughs> don't give it to Mike. <laughs> but that was the first one, actually. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Wow! Thanks for bringing us there. My second question is. Did you always know that you wanted to be a creator? And when did you make that decision? No, I fell into it. This was something that has taken me by surprise. And now thinking back and connecting the dots, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. I'm someone who really enjoys like analytical thinking plus like the creative elements. Having that as part of something that I work on every single day is what gives me so much energy. And I had bits and parts of that when I was working in tech as a PM, but now having like full creative control over my own content, creating educational content and putting that out there and having it help people, like that's super meaningful for me. So I stumbled into this, but it's something that I definitely want to keep going. That's amazing. Yeah. I think we're all better off because of it. <laughs> and my last question I love asking to anybody, I think it gives so much, what does your Instagram Explore page look like? Mm -hmm. First thing that comes to mind, 
so many cat and animal videos. It's embarrassing <laughs> how much uh, it knows me, how well it knows me. Suggested for you is like just like cat memes. Do you yeah. know like orange cat theory? It's just like all orange cats have a singular brain cell that they all share. <laughs> I grew up with an orange cat, very soft spot in my heart, but it's a lot of animal memes. Love. And then probably mixed in there is like fashion bloggers and vloggers that I follow. Yeah. Incredible. She's a cat lady. Can I ask that question back to you? What would we see on your explore page? <laughs> <laughs> Whips out the phone. If, if you really want to know. Um, lot of male fitness. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, lots of planes. Planes. Yeah. And then, like, I would say half of it is just Jacob Lordy shirtless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Yeah, exactly. That one I get. Yeah, Honestly, yeah. that should be on my suggested for you. He's an internet's boyfriend. We yeah. love him. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for those questions. Of course. We'll move on to the next segment where I ask you some questions. So, Mike, could you please introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit more about you, where you grew up, and how you grew up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, I'm Mike. Uh, I grew up in Sugarland, Texas, just outside of Houston. Uh, I grew up in a, a really nice household, um, loving parents, but they both worked. So I was pretty independent from a very young age. Um, and if you know anything about Texas suburbs, they're large, sprawling, and very boring. Uh, but it was a nice little childhood. Um, it was the old school days, you know, so we played outside. We had a little tree house in the backyard. There are neighborhood kids. I remember we, we would play like flag football all the time. Um, and then obviously as a good Asian child, I did my kumon <laughs> and went to cello camp, play piano, all the check marks. And then I went to school at, in Austin at UT, uh, studied chemical engineering. My dream job at the time was to go work for ExxonMobil. It really is just, I think a uh, mixture of, I wanted something challenging. Uh, like you said before, I love uh, anything analytical and also was really good at the sciences. So, one thing led, led to another and ended up there. Um, I remember doing one internship in college. I was shipped off to a chemical plant, like south, south, like middle of nowhere through swamp. And it was like eight in the morning. And my boss is like, you wanna go climb that sulfur tank? And I'm like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's a hundred degrees, you walk outside, glasses fog up, I'm climbing up this tank. There's like death like little signs all around being like, if you see the blue light, you're dead. And I'm like, why would anyone want this job and what am I doing? From that moment, decided I was not gonna be a chemical engineer. I was looking for other options and eventually um, fell into consulting. I love that story because you're able to look back and see what you like and didn't like about that internship so that it could propel you to the next step where you're like, I don't wanna do this anymore. I wanna explore something else. Yeah, yeah, it was, I think, if I think about my trajectory in life, it's been a lot of uh, process of elimination, mm. right? Where I think I want something, it doesn't really work out, then I want the next thing, it doesn't really work out. I'm envious of people who have strong direction, I really am. Mm. Like a passion from the start and they know they wanna do that. Mine was more of a, like a mixed bag, somehow stumbling, but stumbling to the right next step. Um, and I, I've reflected a lot about it and I think it's a, what, a good thing is it's allowed me to explore yeah. a bunch. Like, find me in places that I never would have expected, both location and also job. But also I think B-School was the right decision to one, stumble into, but mm -hmm. then really try to set my set my career path in, in a direction that I uh, would be interested in long-term. Awesome, yes, and we definitely will get to more MBA questions later, but I- I'm teasing you guys. <laughs> a little teaser. <laughs> um, but. I, I mean, I think it's much more common than we think, the like experimentation mm -hmm. and process of elimination. It's like, how are we supposed to know what we want to do? And I'm envious of those people who think they know, but like, if you don't try a zillion things, yeah. how will you know it's the right thing? Yeah, exactly. Like life, as well as dating, is like a buffet. <laughs> Have you heard of this theory? It's no. a buffet. You want to walk around, you want to see what's out there, you want to sample some stuff. And then you want to decide on what you like and eat that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, what if you sit down and you start with the cold chicken frittata? No one likes that, no one likes you know? That. Meanwhile, someone over there is eating crab legs. So in life and dating and career, it's all buffet. And I feel like um, that's things. exactly, that's so right. Like try as much as you can, really build a breadth of opportunity that you see 
for mm-hmm. yourself and out in the world um, and go after it. I mean, I know we can dig in a lot deeper here, but I mean, I'm just thinking people say your 20s are for experimentation and exploration. And then your 30s and 40s and beyond is for when you find something that you really enjoy doing or love doing. And then you dive in deep there. Yeah. Yeah. That resonates deeply. And I, I think part of that too is how I was raised and how my parents were raised. So my parents immigrated from China. It was part of like the first opening up and they came here for a postdoc degree, but back in China at the time, like your life was entirely directed, right? Like Mm -hmm. you had a path, the government told you what you you would study, your test scores determined where you'd go, and it really was very defined. There was not really choice or agency in that process. And then coming here, getting education, raising kids in a Western style, I think they really imbued in me sort of this like curiosity um, to like, try new things to go new places. And my mom will tell that, tell that to me too. She's like, Michael, she calls him Michael. <laughs> um, she's like, you should go travel when you're young. You should have the opportunities that I didn't have. Mm-hmm. Go see the world, go try new things. Like, I wish I could be you at this time, but I'm not, so you should go do it. And I think that really sits deeply in my heart and in sort of how I look at my 20s, 30s and beyond. I also love to travel. <laughs> That's very powerful. Um, and a very deep takeaway. I didn't know I was there. We we're there. We, yeah, exactly. We, we I guess got, we're digging deep. We just got there. <laughs> so Mike, you first started your career after school in management consulting at McKinsey specifically. And in the most basic terms, like you were explaining it to a third grader, what is management consulting? I asked that question, same question too, I think after I got the job. In the most basic, basic terms, I think management consulting is solving pressing business challenges. It's very broad, so it's hard to define, but I would get pulled into projects that were both growth oriented, so how do we grow sales in this business uh, over the next five years, and also um, sort of turnaround or, or cost oriented, so how do we save this business from failing, and everything in between. It is so broad, but it really is just solving, helping executives solve problems. Hmm. And what type of companies would hire management consulting firms? It really spans a gamut. Um, It's Fortune 500. I think there's no public numbers, but I imagine most, if not all, work with some sort of consulting firm. Um, They, I've served uh, D2C, like brands that were part of a larger corporation, but they operated independently. So that's uh, higher ed, um, nonprofits, the government. It really is. Mm-hmm. It really is a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. So how does it work? These firms, Fortune 500, usually big companies, because hiring management consultants is pricey. Mm-hmm. They would hire you guys, and you're a McKinsey consultant. You would go in and work with them for how long would a project be? Again, hard to say. Everything is so vague and project by project, but an average one might be three, four months. I've heard of projects that last a year if you're doing a big transformation of a large enterprise. There's also short projects that are like two week sprints of just diligence for um, like a PE fund looking to acquire a business. Mm-hmm. So they want an answer right away and like they have like very, very tight deal deadlines. So again, it's, it's everything and anything in between. Day to day, what do management consultants do? Like for example, in the diligence process, you're hired by um, ExxonMobil, for example, to diligence another company that they mm-hmm. might want to acquire. Are you, as a management consultant, are you Googling things all day? How does that work? That's a good question, the day to day. Um, as, as an analyst, as an incoming analyst, your job um, primarily revolves around one, maybe two work streams. So you are hyper-focused on one thing, part of the larger project. So if we take the dil- diligence example, you are, yes, you're Googling. You are setting up expert calls to learn about a space. Maybe ExxonMobil is looking to acquire in, in sort of the sustainability climate space and they don't have expertise there. So you're building the expertise. You are, maybe you're, you're in project management. So you're building like uh, Gantt charts and structure to keep the full team going forward. You are problem solving with your internal team, McKinsey team, to solve problems. You know, what framework should we use to analyze 
what makes a good or bad diligence target, or you're talking to clients, you know, you're, you're talking about your ideas, their ideas and syndicating that and bringing it back to the team. Um, but again, within the whole realm of your work stream, as you move up in consulting, so you become a manager, I'm going to use McKinsey terms, you become an associate partner, then partner, like your responsibility get, responsibilities get more broad mm. um, and maybe your client engagement gets deeper. But still, I think as, as an incoming analyst, you are exposed to, you know, the client team. It could be an executive. You could work directly with some VP director level. So it's great exposure at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And what are some pros versus cons of joining management consulting? Yeah, good question. And, and excited to help your listeners debunk this. Um, I think there's a, a, a negative perception, I think, of manager consulting, um, especially McKinsey. But I think there are a lot of pros and a lot of cons, right? So I'll start with the pros. Um, a, pros is I think it's the best business training so we can get out of undergrad. It really is like drinking by the fire hydrant. Um, you are thrown into a project. You are expected to learn quickly, and you do. You're giving a, given a lot of support. There's a huge focus on people development. And within my two years uh, at McKinsey, uh, I just can reflect and, and see that I've grown so much as a professional in that time. Um, I think another pro is that your scope of what you can possibly do is very broad. Right? I think going back to our earlier conversation of how do you know what you want to do? And that was my exact question leaving college. And consulting was and was pitched to me as a great opportunity to do something without fully knowing what you want to do, right? So mm-hmm. you can ping pong between consumer, healthcare, sort of government, industrials, um, and get a little flavor of, of everything and see mm-hmm. where you might want to end up when you exit consulting. I think also third, it's just very fun. Like the teams get really tight. You find people you love working with. You get to travel. Like there's a there's a lifestyle around consulting that um maybe you've you've picked up from our classes in b-school but it's a lot about hotel points and flights and gaming that system but at the end of the day it's very very team-based there's lots of training there's lots of opportunities to get together to colleagues i think back warmly Mm. about my time at mckinsey um so that being said i think there are a few cons as well um hours not great what mckinsey like to say is that this job is more than a job, but less than a life. So you can imagine like where that falls in in the work life balance spectrum. Well, so what are the hours typically as like a first year analyst? And then does it get better as you get more senior, or is it still like you're working until like what is it two a.m. two a.m. You go to bed, you wake up at like nine a.m. Yeah. What is it? What does it look like? There's a lot of inputs to that equation. Mm-hmm. Um, in the beginning, you're less efficient, right? So it's going to take you longer to do things. I would say, and it also depends on project, right? Some are very intense, especially those two week uh, diligences, but some, if you have a year long project, you can spread your work better. So I would say I normally worked like 9 a.m. check in. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe I'll get out of the office like seven or eight, go home, work out, eat dinner, and have an hour to plug in, you know, 10 to 11, 11 to 12. More work. More work, yeah. Mm. Um, either that or setting up the next day. It's very flexible, I would say. Like, besides your check in, check out, the way you use your time is up to you. Um, there is just an expectation that you will get this quality of work done and this volume of work done at this time. Mm. Yeah. My best projects, honestly, I got away with like working six hours a week or six hours a day. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> six hours a week. Which you one imagine? Is it, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> six hours a day. This is during COVID, though, so it's easier yeah. to hide. Yeah. Yeah. And then at its worst. At its worst, I maybe worked until 4 a.m., woke up the next day at 7 back in the office and did that for a week. I know. Yeah. Yeah. There's a camaraderie to it, though. There is. I think, I mean, I talked about it in one of my last podcasts with Jen, the idea of swallowing the frog. Have you heard of that? (laughs) What are you swallowing? Who's frog? (laughs) You're swallowing the frog. It's the idea that you need to put in the blood, sweat, and tears uh-huh. in your first few years outside of college yeah. to set yourself up for success. And then, not saying you can like coast after that, but because yeah. you have the pedigree or the job title or whatever, you have a much easier life. And I think maybe our generation, millennial-ish, is like used to doing that. But I think the younger generations are really 
pushing back against that. Yeah. How do you feel? Girl, I swallowed the frog. I know. I swallowed that whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's right. And especially coming from, I would say, what, what I would consider like a target, but not so target school like UT Austin. I think there was a chip on my shoulder. Like I have a lot to prove and I want to aim for the best. Um, and McKinsey was that kind of proof point for me too of like, sure. yes, I can, I can go out and get this job that is so coveted mm -hmm. that I, I want at the time wanted. And I think you never know, but I think it's part of the reason that I got here. Mm. To dive into this a little bit deeper in terms of like chip on your shoulder, I've felt that too in different aspects of my life. But now that your resume is quite stacked, Mike. So is yours. Do you still feel that there is like in a chip somewhere or is that something that we've grown from or will it always be there? I don't have an answer to this. I hope you do. <laughs> I think in some form or fashion, it'll always be there. Like there are, there are moments where you think you'll get to at the time. You're like, only if I only get to this level, mm -hmm. then I will be absolved of my past, right? Like all of whatever, it's regrets, it's guilt, shame, maybe these are two strong words, but all that past will go away. And I think it's just not how it works. Like your past will carry forward with you. Like joining McKinsey, I was like, okay, we're all McKinsey, but no, there are people from Harvard mm. and are like Stanford, MIT, and then I went to UT Austin. So I think there was a different treatment in the class or now you go to Stanford too, but we're at GSB, but no, your past still matters, right? Like consulting, PE, tech versus, you know, something non-traditional I think there's a lot there that you carry with you um, but I think over time what I've realized that you know external validation points of that used to matter so much to me no longer do or I they do but to a much less extent and sure. I think um, just as I've matured and grown confident in my path forward and what I want to do next I really don't care that much about like what people think mm-hmm it's kind of powerful when you get there. It is. Otherwise, it's chasing the next thing for external validation, and that may never stop. Exactly. And a, a good analog is like, no matter how much money you have, if you keep looking upwards, there will always be someone with more, mm -hmm. right? And you'll always feel like you have less versus just being happy with what you have and where you're going. Mm -hmm. um, I think that can be extrapolated to career to life i like to be just rem try as much as or i like to try as best as i can to remain in the present and just enjoy the people i'm with mm -hmm. you mentioned a little bit about the lifestyle of consultants could you talk a little bit more about that and just like very candid terms like i've heard conversations with some of our consulting classmates it's not uncommon to be like oh i have this airline status or um, status at some sort of lounge because yeah. of the travel and the fancy meals. And how annoying is that? <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten used to it. And I was like, I want status. <laughs> Everyone should have status. Yeah. Go get some. Yeah. Um, the lifestyle can be glamorous. It can also be deeply unglamorous. Um, so I think I, I've done a broad swath of projects to have experienced both. Uh, as a selling point, the lifestyle, especially for a 22, 23 year old right out of undergrad, is something that you're not used to, something that you're thrown in right away and you just love it. You love, I remember waking up early on Mondays to go to the airport because I knew I was flying first class and I was so excited. Or checking in the hotel, you like walk in and it's like a very nice room at the Ritz Carlton and you're like, oh my gosh, yes. And these little things that make the other cons of the job we talked about earlier kind of disappear for a second. Mm. Um, then there's also times where, you know, you're not flying first, you're stuck in the back. You're going to, I've been to so many random places, like the border of Alabama and Georgia, what's there? <laughs> Nothing but a pit mine. I've been to like Eastern Washington and like four hours north of LA. Like um, I've seen a lot of the country actually. So mm. uh, in, in, in those places, maybe the nicest hotel is La Quinta and you're stuck away from friends for the most, for a large part of the week and you miss birthdays and you just want to be in bed and you lose routine. Um, and the only food to eat is a 
Wendy's, you know. <laughs> that cannot be true. Sometimes it's Wendy's, girl. Really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so it's tough. Um, but I think you you make of it what you will and you have choices. Like some people refuse to travel and that's that's fine. They don't want to travel. They have families to take care of. They stay local. Other people do and they want to get out and see the world. Other people only have specific places they would go and then the staffing manager will work with you to try to match your interests and you sort of um, what you're solving for uh, to the project. Not always the case, but sometimes you look out. Mm. My nicest trip, you wanna hear about that? Yeah, let's hear. My nicest trip, I um, got to go to Nice, France for a week. International. International, baby. And that was, that was fun. It was like with, it was like a Paris-based team. So they're doing some sort of summit, I think, in, in France. Um, so I went out there and you can alt travel on the weekends if you want. So I gave myself a weekend there before. I stopped in Porto afterwards and I flew back to the States and I was like, oh, so fabulous. <laughs> That sounds quite glamorous. Yeah. It almost cancels out the the Wendy's and the La Quinta between Alabama and Georgia. You're yeah. like, where? Where? I forgot all about it. <laughs> I'm in Nice. <laughs> and so an acronym we hear quite often in the consulting world or conversations is MBB, um, which stands for? McKinsey Bain BCG. What is the allure of MBB? MBB is, is the moment. She's it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, MBB stands for McKinsey, Bain, BCG. They are the three most prominent management consulting firms. Um, there are a lot of others, of course, and other specialized consulting firms, but it kind of is like similar to bulge bracket banking or like FANG and tech, I imagine. It's, you know, the firms that everyone wants to work for. You see people you admire working there. Um, they're, mo they're most prestigious, presumably better exit ops. Um, especially in the in the B school world, I think admissions really value MBB in the same way they value like large private equity or big tech. It's quite competitive again to too, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it's sort of known as the gold standard of consulting. Hmm. Can you break into consulting not from undergrad and not from like a business school or graduate school program? Is that possible or is it common or not really? You can. I think consulting is a world of exceptions, not rules, so you can. Um, I think it's less common than sort of the traditional undergrad or business school pipelines. I've seen it done. Um, I had a colleague at McKinsey who uh, started an industry and then went to Deloitte, and then from Deloitte pivoted over and switched to McKinsey, so that's one path. Um, there are expert hires. Uh, that McKinsey makes, but those are generally people who have been in industry for a while and have built expertise in one area that then they get hired to be a specialist for. One manager actually worked at sort of some oil and gas company that I interned with years ago that I met, and then we were somehow staffed in the same project later. So it does happen, but I would say much less common than mm -hmm. the traditional pipeline. Mm -hmm. And for people who are going through the traditional pipeline, is there some advice that you would give them? Do your cases, do the math. No, I would say like the traditional pipeline is very, it's tried and true, right? There are people who have done it before you, they know the process, it doesn't really change. Leverage those people, they can be your river guides. Um, Cause I think doing it alone is, is challenging and mentally taxing. Um, I would say for me, if you're already in the case process and you've decided that you want to do consulting and you started to meet people and started preparing cases, do them with a partner. I th it's difficult and uncommon for people to practice problem solving out loud, but that's what they test you in the interview. Um, and then just get to a point where you feel comfortable, um, but you feel like you're plateauing out. You know, like there's diminishing marginal returns for each additional case you do. At that point, kind of call it what it is and focus on something else, right? Um, you don't have to overstress yourself for the interview. Mm. I think a lot of people did, and that's honestly how you burn out mm. in the interview and also in the job. I interviewed uh, for McKinsey and Consulting my junior year I know that. for internships. This was when I was either going to go the consultant route mm. or product manager route for my junior year internship. And I remember practicing a case with one of my friends from college who's a couple years older they were already working in McKinsey mm -hmm. they were helping me prep 
after our prep, and I never told this to him, I cried. (laughs) I was so stressed out because at one part of the case, you know, he was he was helping me, yeah. and he was just like kind of grilling me on the numbers and asking me to do a lot of mental math right there on the spot. And I was just like already so flustered and nervous yeah. that like I said something wrong, and then I, mean, I was like an order of like magnitude off, and it was just like what? And I just felt so dumb that afterwards I was like, <laughs> I remember just collapsing on my bed. I was like, oh thanks so much for helping me out. <laughs> Hang up, and I was just like, ah. like what uh. just happened? We've all been there. Yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. It is tough. It's in that environment. It's high pressure. Uh, There's someone looking at you and you feel like every second you take is five minutes. Like you have to fill time and you have to think really fast. And I think that's what the case is supposed to test. It's like, can you perform under pressure? Unfortunately, (laughs) sometimes you end up crying afterwards and that's fine. But I, did you do another case? Like, did, I did. did you feel more comfortable as you went? I felt more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, I knew the process was going to be super tough, yeah. and I had to keep at it if this was something that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, that's so right. And I, I think up until this point, it's still true. The hardest I've ever worked for anything was my McKinsey offer. Really? Yes. It was. Well, so I applied junior year, similar to you. Um, didn't get the internship at the time. So I then went to work for Capital One um, and then came around uh, for the second time for full-time hiring and then uh, sort of got the offer. But between, over over the course of that like year and change, year and four months, it was just always in my mind, continue prepping, cased over the summer while I was working the internship, cased at school, did the networking, met the people. It was, I was... It was really, a grind. It was a grind, and I was like very steadfast in, in sort of what I wanted, and I, I, I knew I was going to do it. Mm, very determined. Thank you. For people who are unfamiliar with the management consulting world, what is something that would surprise them? Something that would surprise them. I think what surprised me when I was going to McKinsey, maybe this is a helpful way to answer the question, it is very team based and almost tribal. At least for McKinsey, once you find your people, you stick with it, and that is a tremendous feeling. But also, if you're not, if you don't have that, you feel sort of lost and out of place. It took me a while, like probably over a year, to find my people. But you would think, like, I mean, in any organization, like there's a structure, and then there's a larger team, and you kind of are with those people, but you don't really have a choice of who you work with all the time. But consulting is entirely different, like from one project to the next, you could switch, pivot, change people. If you don't like someone, you never have to work with them again, ever. I mean, if you want to stay in McKinsey for a long time, I think you have to find your people. Hmm. I'm learning more and more in business school. It's stressed this year in our second year classes, how important it is, the people you work with, the people you work for. It's yeah. definitely like business is just people. It's people, it's yeah. It's people. And I think a good way to think about business school is not so much business, but leadership school. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the classes I've taken here are about how to manage people, how to handle diff- difficult conversations, how to properly assess people and, and make hiring and firing decisions. Um, and McKinsey was the, uh, very similar um, experience and, and way to learn that. Like There are some managers where I just absolutely hated them and could not wait for the project to be over. And there are others that I followed for nine months. Shout out Kylie. Um, That I just absolutely loved and and never wanted to work with anyone else afterwards. Mm -hmm. We're gonna pivot to the MBA experience. Um, I know her. (laughs) So Mike, what was the impetus in wanting to get an MBA degree? I think in the back of my head, I always knew I was going to get an MBA. I think if you go into MBB or other similar fields after school, it's a very common path. You see people do it. It's almost like part of your training is that you told you're being groomed to go to B school. Um, so that was always in the back of my head. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I think McKinsey less so than other firms just because the structure is a little different. But yeah, I think a lot of people have an idea of B-School once they, when they come into consulting, and I was no different. Mm-hmm. Um, 
there are a lot of two plus two mm-hmm. in my class, for example. I would say, I think after McKinsey, I went to go um, help lead growth at an early stage startup just to test out the entrepreneurship uh, bone in me and really enjoyed it, but um, started to feel like I was being closed in on a career. Like I couldn't see as many exits afterwards and it felt a little restrictive. Um, and also at that point, I was still testing out, so I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And B school at that time became the right opportunity to um, go explore further. I think those extra two years of experience outside of consulting were really helpful in to me here and helping me think through opportunities and having real life experience mm-hmm. um, of you know what I didn't like, what I did like about entrepreneurship or sort of the growth side of the business or sales or anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say it was kind of always um, on my path. Mm. Do you think you need an MBA to succeed or rise up in management consulting? And I ask that because in tech, it's usually looked down upon to mm. get an MBA, especially when so many people are such success- successful entrepreneurs without getting this graduate school degree. However, it's interesting because a lot of the VPs or execs, the CEO, all have MBA degrees, unless they're like super scrappy, bootstrapped, like started their own company. It's either that or you have the more traditional business background. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think not so much anymore from an analyst perspective, right? A lot of people do pursue the MBA route. Other people just get promoted directly. It depends on what you want. And I think for a lot of consultants who come in knowing that they won't be in consulting forever, they want to explore, the MBA is a great opportunity to both have that career time to explore careers, but also get a little break. Like you've been working for four-ish years, Mm -hmm. working very hard, you're swallowing all the frogs. Mm -hmm. Like you kind of want a little break um, and you have the opportunity to get sponsored. So it really puts the pressure off of getting MBA, both career-wise and financially. And we've talked about sort of breaking into um, MBB and how an MBA is helpful for that because it's a more traditional pipeline to get into it. But you don't once you're in it, you don't need it. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I know a few people in my start class who did it and they're still very successful at the firm. Mm-hmm. And so for people who are currently in management consulting, either MBB or, of course, any other firm, they're applying to business school right now. How do they stand out? Because there's so many consultants who want to get this type of degree. It's always funny to think in hindsight and posit how you got in. Um, I think for me, I always since I always had business school in my mind um, and I knew I wanted to explore, I decided to make that exploration decision before B-School. So leaving McKinsey, join the startup, just um, as a point of differentiation, but also I was very curious. I think if you are in a consulting firm, want to get into a top B school, I think it's about sort of the story that you tell and craft, uh, both in your essays, but also with your work. So if you are super passionate about, um, you know, social impact or education or healthcare, like showing that through what you do and the impact you make on your teams outside of work um, will help you stand out. But also it's a black box, so who knows? Kirsten Moss knows. Kirsten Moss knows. The former Dean of Admissions. Um, but we, we may never know. What has been your favorite class so far at the GSB? Well, I'm a sucker for anything like leadership, role play. I love that stuff. I can't stand an accounting or finance class, sorry. Um, I really enjoyed a class called uh, Acting with Power, taught by a Professor uh, Deb Grunfield. And it's just a fabulous class of sort of understanding power dynamics and a com- or the framework we always went back to was uh, warm and cold and hard and soft power. And you get all these opportunities to role play and test like where you behave on that quadrant and how it impacts others and your decisions or your to behave can change based on like the impact of the person or kind of the behavior that you want to admit. So I thought it was a fantastic class. It was super insightful. Mm. Um, one takeaway I had was commonly we think that to be powerful, you must be cold and high power, right? Like stern leader, like forceful CEO, but 
the more effective, I think, leadership style for me was actually warm high power. So coaching, mentoring, like building a team and creating an environment that people could succeed and felt comfortable succeeding. So I thought that was very interesting. Hmm. I would have loved to have taken that class. Great class. I, I love that takeaway because it flips on its head what we think in the movies, what a CEO looks like. Wolf of Wall Street, come on. Right. Right? It doesn't have to be like that. Exactly. Um, so I love that takeaway. Yeah. What's next for you in the short term and long term? What is next for me in the short term? I think the short term, if I think from now until graduation, is enjoy every damn second I have left this place. Um, yeah. It really is a crazy experience to be uh, thrown into business school, meet 400 strangers, and then after a year and a couple months, you feel like these are the closest people you've ever been with mm-hmm. in your life. But two years is a short time, so, so I really want to focus on being intentional and, and how I sort of prioritize the people that I really care about. Mm-hmm. Aww. Uh, I think after graduation, I will pursue a search fund um, and then hopefully long term, um, either continue doing that if I love it or switch to um, sort of family office investing Mm -hmm. um, or operating depends. This might be opening up a can of worms, but what is a search fund? What is a search fund? That's a great question. So a search a search fund, uh, which is also known as um, entrepreneurship through acquisition, is a fairly new asset class where funds invest in individuals, not companies. And then these individuals called searchers go out and find companies to acquire. Um, they usually play uh, below the middle market. So these companies range from five to $20 million in value. And it really is for people who want to be entrepreneurial, but don't really subscribe to the VC backed, like zero to one um, type of entrepreneurship. This is for people who love building and love growing and love teams um, and want to start with something already established. Mm -hmm. What about that is exciting to you? I think exciting for all the reasons that I just touched on. From my past experience, I tried the zero to one VC backed startup, startup. It was very scrappy. I think it's sexy from the outside, but it was really like running around uh, like a headless chicken on the inside. Mm. Um, we were struggling to fr- find product market fit. Uh, company strategies pivoted every week or so. Um, it really was um, all hands on deck all the time, which is fun and exciting to build in that way, but just not something that I was entirely comfortable with or I thought my like McKinsey toolkit helped me do. So in this way where you're you're finding a business that probably is, you know, bootstrapped from the ground up. The founder has been operating and leading it for 50 years and wants to retire, but doesn't have a succession plan. You're stepping in as a new CEO to professionalize, to bring resources, to make hires, mm-hmm. to bring a strategic lens to how they grow um, and sort of build the team along the way. And for me, that was just very, very exciting. Mm. Excited to see your your next move after graduation. Thank you. It could also fail deeply, and I'll come back to Cherie's Corner and talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all part of it, right? Yeah. It's like, um, I, I know with search, it can be tough to even find the company that you're trying to acquire. It's not something that happens in a month or two. It can be a year or multi-year long process. Mm-hmm. So that, I mean, that's just something that kind of blows my mind. Yeah. And at the end of the day too, it's all about the people, Mm -hmm. right? And a lot of careers that you can jump into and you don't have to ever go beyond your scope of work, but with search is like, you are both the acquirer and the operator. And Mm -hmm. to do all of that, you need to sort of really know how to, I think, work with people, motivate people, um, and convince someone to sell to you. Why would they sell to you versus somebody else? There's a, there's a special connection you have to make. So mm-hmm. um, all of that is very exciting to me. I love the challenge, looking forward to it, um, and excited to see what's next. Mm-hmm. And the final question I have for you, what is something that you've learned about yourself over the past few years? I think I've learned that what really matters to me is the people around me. Mm-hmm. I can be very happy if I I'm surrounded by close friends who are very supportive. Um, 
care about me and we can just kind of shoot this shit and hang out. I think for a large part of, I guess, childhood and early career, I was always chasing. Mm -hmm. The next thing, the thing that I thought people wanted me to do, that I would make people proud, parents, friends, peers, you know, like Mm -hmm. it was always very competitive and didn't really know why I was doing it. I was just doing it. So in the past few years and coming to business school and having the time to reflect, it really is um, at the end of the day about the people for me. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that we're like born knowing. I feel like it's a level of maturity and also something that's probably been really important in business school. I've felt it myself where there's these milestones and kind of just like looking around to see what is everyone else doing in life, in their career, in social. It's really easy to move with the tide if you don't have a very solid core of what exactly gives you purpose and meaning. Yeah, exactly. Like move with the tide or even felt left behind by the tide, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I I think business school can be hard from that perspective too of everyone's doing so much, why am I not doing enough? And you kind of get in this like downward spiral in your head. Mm -hmm. You always have to remember to pick yourself back up and be happy with where you are, what you're doing, who you're with. I I think it's really important to remember. Mm -hmm. Comparison is the thief of joy. Suck those frogs. (laughs) I don't think that's, I don't think it's, uh, eat those frogs. Um, Mike, those are all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? I think we covered it all. Is there anything that you would want to ask? Ask you? Yeah. Oh my gosh, what do I ask you? Cherie? Yes? What have you most enjoyed and least enjoyed in B-School? What a special time. I, you and I have talked about this recently, and maybe what I most enjoyed is also what I least enjoyed. So I'm thinking out loud right now, but business school has been just such an incredible time to take a step back and really zoom out like what are the aspects of my life that matter most to me and i've enjoyed that i've been able to reflect and not only reflect but then like dive in deep and for the places that i'm unhappy with or i feel like i could use some patching up there's like classes that can help me fill in those gaps but i think what i've least enjoyed about business school is that in taking a step back and zooming out i've also found places that could use some more work or I'm like wait a second I thought I felt very confident in um, my like social skills or like I'm an outgoing person that's totally fine but then I'm thrown into this situation I'm like wait I actually feel FOMO for the first time in like four years I thought I was completely over this so while I'm definitely like reflecting and learning a lot about myself it's also unearthing a lot of I think anxieties or self-doubt that I thought like this was an obstacle that we were facing previously like I thought I was at a good place in my life so it's it's both um good and bad a double-edged sword in that way yeah it really put you through the ringer huh Uh Mm uh-huh really it really did but I mean overall net net like business school is such a special experience and similar to what you said like so ready to soak up every last second of it we have five months left Mike don't even say the number. I know. Well, I mean, where do you stand? Are you? Do you want more time at business school? Do you want to maximize the time? Or would you stay for another extra year? I think I'm ready to make money again. <laughs> <laughs> business school is expensive. Yeah. I think we all know, but you don't really know until you're here. Um, I think I'm, I'm ready to graduate. You're I think I've, yeah. I think I've done the work. I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I've met some really, really good people, and it's time to go back into the world. Yeah. And get a paycheck. Mm-hmm. Girl, get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode of Sheree's Corner with Mike. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Sheree's Corner with Mike. Before we get to the main takeaways, please like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. And I would so appreciate it if you could share this episode with someone who might find this content helpful. Alrighty, 
let's get to the takeaways. The first takeaway is that life is like a buffet. You wanna walk around, sample a few things before you dive in. I love this part of the conversation with Mike because it applies to career, life, and dating. I truly believe that our 20s are for experimentation and our 30s and 40s and beyond are for diving deep and specializing. On the career front, I was always really envious when I heard young people talk about having a specific passion for a specific industry or thing. In high school, in college, and even after college, I didn't really feel like I had a thing. And that used to weigh really heavily on me because I would see everyone having the thing that they were into, that they were going to pursue for the rest of their lives. But I truly believe that through experimentation and trying and sampling a lot of different things out there, you're able to learn what your preferences are. And through the process of elimination, I'm able to get closer to the thing that drives me. The second big takeaway from this conversation is that comparison is the thief of joy. I really like the discussion where Mike talked and disclosed to us about the chip on his shoulder and how that drives him to work hard. We're not going to apologize for having a chip on our shoulder because it ends up being motivation for us to achieve our dreams and sometimes get into institutions like McKinsey, like Stanford, that open up new opportunities for us. However, where it can go wrong is if we continually compare and look upwards. I really liked it when Mike said, if your goal is to make money, there will always be more money. And if you look up the ladder, there will always be someone who has more money than you. And you will always feel like you have less. So make sure you're chasing the right thing and you have goals that will ultimately fulfill you. The third main takeaway is Mike's amazing breakdown of management consulting. We learn about the pros and cons of management consulting firms like McKinsey, Bain, and BCG. Some of the pros being the interesting breadth of work, the potentially glitzy fun lifestyle, and the leadership learning that you get along the way. On the flip side of that, there are many cons that Mike also listed out. Sometimes consultants are required to travel to third or fourth tiered cities and they have to stay there for a couple of weeks away from their friends, away from their family while they're working. It can be really unglamorous in that way. Also, as Mike described, there are times where he had to work extremely long hours that weren't very sustainable. All in all, I really loved hearing about Mike's journey through management consulting and also looking forward to what he wants to do next with his search fund. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Cherie's Corner. I'll see you next time. Bye!